So um, the board asked me to come in and just give it a little summary of the revaluation that we've done. So uh, you know we were contracted to do the full revaluation, um, or the half, or I think it was about a half year review. So we did an analysis of all the properties, and uh, so some of the things that we look at when we do that is construction costs, land values, and then uh, as you were talking earlier, income, rental, and capital issue rates. So once all the sales were qualified. We made sure they were on length. Um, the first thing that we look at is adjusting the land. Curve. So we don't get a lot of land sales, but we get land residuals, which is an extraction of the total sale price less the building and residuals for land, which gives us an indication of what the um, land value should be. Um, the property values in general uh, have gone up about, in one year, believe it or not, it was a very strong year, uh, 20%. Uh, we look also at what's called the land to building ratio. So that's a ratio of what contribution land to building we were talking about that earlier. So in a community like this, we look to see something where about 45% of the value is toward the land and about 55, 56% is toward the building. This land to building ratio is that I've analyzed all the way from Boston, all the way out to the Virtue. Just for a little education for the board, if you go into Boston, the land is actually worth more, worth more than the river, which makes sense. As you get to Cambridge and Medford and, and um, Somerville, it's about 50-50. So by the time you get out to 128, it's around 45. And you're pretty close to the 128 area. And so um, right now, we finalized the values with the land to building ratio of 44% land and 56% building, which is a very appropriate. Um, so when we did the analysis for the coming up, we were slightly lower than that. We were like 42. So just looking at the residuals, looking at the construction process, slowly starting to level off a little bit. A lot of the reasons why we were lower was because building costs over the last couple of years have really skyrocketed. So what happened was, you know, lumber and everything, the costs were kind of so much in a couple of years that it shifted. But this year it's calmed down a little bit. Um, supply lines are getting better. So the land went up 25%, where the average for the buildings went up about 15%. So there was a little bit of a catch up of what was going on. Um, so the, but I, we noticed that anything over the prime lot, the larger properties, the excess price we have is 37.3. The market with the residuals over the prime lot indicated that that price shouldn't go up. So although the land curve for a prime lot went up 25%, the excess land stayed the same at 37.3. So as I'll show you in a moment, that gave an indication that land as a whole, uh, vacant land went up 22% because there's some contributory land value that was stable while the prime lot went up to 25. So actually, when you look at it as, um, you know, the whole of the town going up around 19, 20%, land was just slightly higher than that. But that uh, did shift the land to building ratio by about 2%. Um, so building costs, as I said, once the land was set, we uh, then finalized the building costs to the sales. And they were about, on average, about for the residential buildings, the Capes, the Colonials, ranches, so forth. The average was about $160 a square foot last time, last year. Um, now it's 185. So those costs are still going up. Um, and, it, and they did go up about 15%. So again, that's 21 sales, 2021 sales. Now we're looking at 2022 for next year. And I think that those still will continue to go up because interest rates 
up till the middle of the year was still low. I think the pattern we'll see probably for the end of this year and early next year is more of a leveling off because of supply of money has gone up the cost. And as we were talking earlier, it's really not as much what people will pay for the house, it's what they can afford to pay. Mm -hmm. So when rates are low, they have more buying power. When rates are higher, they have less buying power. So for example, let's say someone was paying um, $2,000 mortgage at interest rates at three, three and a half percent. Well, interest rates now are at seven. So it would cost for the same house that they bought, the buying power now is they have to spend $4,000 $4, a month instead of two thousand. Mm -hmm. So it's literally double. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're seeing a lot more houses on the market and you're hearing about things around this date, you know, in October, November, where um, the volume of sales is really dropping, which, you know, it's been like a 10 year run. Usually you get a five or six year run and then you get a little downturn. Uh, this has been because the feds have kept the interest rates so low for so long because there was no inflation. Now inflation came and I think that they feel they need to get it up to, to, to where it's seven, eight, nine. So, cause it's really one of the few tools they have when things really do get bad use an adjustment to come down to stimulate the economy. Um, because don't forget, out of uh, the gross national product, 70% of it is spending, consumer spending. So with that said, um, again, we went up about 19%. So I have on here a chart that shows the different classes of properties. And the single families as a whole went up 19, the condos 15, two families 16, three families 18, apartments 17. Um, just to talk about the two threes and apartments, over the last few years, they've been going up an astronomical amount. And I think what's happening, not that that's still not a, a large, but it's all now fairly equitable. All those types of properties are fairly equitable. And then the vacant land at 22, is equitable. Even commercial is finally um, improving after COVID, as is industrial. For to have a 9% increase in a year in commercial and 11 in industrial shows some strength in the, in the market. I think it's because people are back out, they're spending and so forth, they're going back to the restaurants, they're going out shopping and so forth. They still are buying things from home. And that's why industrial warehouse space is doing well because of the Amazons and so forth, taking up this space. Uh, but I think it's more balanced again. Even if you look at things like um, the Burlington Mall, which isn't far from here, they've revamped that and really mm -hmm. made it interesting. The Woolbrick Mall now, the small one, they've rechanged it as a different length of style of mm -hmm. living. So you see that everywhere now. Um, those these more of these kind of lifestyle type things. With the Woolbrick Mall was interesting. They cut out the middle where on the input and put apartments behind it. Had the, the boxes are on the side, mm -hmm. kind of odd looking. But they took then they put the pads up front for the smaller spaces. So that they access them right there. Mm -hmm. And it's more, it's kind of going back to old school open the downtown open concept. Yeah. So uh, so that uh, and then the mixed use is usually a blend of the commercial and the residential. And so you can see where it's kind of in between when it's 16%. And then moving on to the residential styles. Um, so I'll just tell you what they are, then we can talk about why they are what they are. So the ranches are going up 20%. The older style properties, which have been going up quite a bit, go down this cycle and went up 7%. Colonials 23, Capes 22, the custom colonials 17, the contemporary moderns 21%, the raised ranch 25, the customs 19. 
the older centuries were very big increase at 29. So the funny part is um, that in general, what we've seen over the last couple of years is a lot of the raised ranches and ranches have been um, in big demand. A lot of that's from uh, baby rules downsizing a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, it's funny, a few years ago, everyone would go to Florida. And now it's a lot of people are deciding maybe we'll go there for a month or something and rent a place. Mm -hmm. But you're not seeing the access for the whole year or so forth. A lot of them might be even global warming and so hot down there now. But you're seeing them downsize, but maybe staying within their community or going to other areas. Uh, before COVID, it was a big uh, um, draw to Boston. Where, well, because you know, you get older, your kids are gone now, they accept dogs yeah. and cats <laughs> in the city, right? Yeah. And so you go there, you get the theater, you get the colleges, you can take a class, you, you get everything mm -hmm. in the city. If you've been over to the seaport, it's just amazing what's going on over there. Like COVID changed all that, but I think it's easing back now. But you'll see that they may stay want to, still want to stay in their community. So they're looking for one level or a cave where a lot of what they do with people is they'll just shut the heat off upstairs and wait for the grandchildren to come on the weekend. <laughs> come visit, they stay up there, and then they have a bedroom in the lower level. So the caves and the ranches and the split levels have been very popular. And you can see here that if the average is around 19, the ranches are at 20, the caves are at 22, and the raised ranches are at 25, and the colonials are at 23, but we break our colonials up into the smaller, older ones that's called colonials, and the newer, modern, larger ones as custom colonials. So the custom colonials are only at 17%. They're usually larger and more estate-like. And some of that is, is that as the baby boomers retire and look for it, the next generation, XYZ and millenniums, there's not as many of them, and they're not looking for that larger type property. Now, I always say that the millenniums are looking for uh, what they call the triangle. I think I created it, but we'll call it the triangle. Where they're looking for a location to live where they're close to where they work and close to where they can be entertained. So it's like a triangle of three places. And as long as within that triangle, there's Wi Fi. So that's why we were joking earlier about the summer hole in Cambridge and those areas, but it's very popular there. And there's a lot of music and entertainment and restaurants, and you're near the city, and there's great transportation. But a lot of people now, young people, don't even get their license for a while. Mm -hmm. They're just relying on public transportation. So it's a shift in, in the whole thing that affects real estate and changes the demographics of the spending of real estate and the prices of them. Um, so that's kind of why you're seeing some of these variances. So, so the next page, if you say, okay, well, you know, how do you know and how do you prove that these went up to these points? Look the page and then look at the first section is the class itself. So, the single families and so forth, um, the average or the median sale price now of a home uh, is one over $1.5 million. And so you have to realize that that's not a three, 4,000 square foot house. That's the average house in the community. And the average size of a house is 2,000 maybe, 2,100 square feet at that price. Uh, the mean obviously is a little higher because uh, Concord does have a lot of large homes that do sell for three, four, five. So midpoint of them, because there's a lot of ranches and capes still in the community is 1.5, but the average selling price is 1.7. And the assessors choose to be slightly below 100% of market value. They tend to come in around 95%. Uh, 
be a little conservative and then it helps a little bit with uh, appeals and then cautious with changes in the market. Because you know what happens, we're analyzing now for January 1st, 2023, we see what's happening over the last six months. But with the other properties that are going up 25%, 24, so by coming 5% lower, we're going up 20, People still know that prices have been going up a lot, but a year and a half is a big difference in the market. Now, over the last 10 years, it's still been behind. It's still going to be behind for next year, even because really interest rates started to kick in high in the last three or four months, you know, with 150 basis point changes in one one lap, 75. So we're just seeing that now because it takes about three months to close the house. So the PNSs were done for these sales now in July or so. So they were still, the rates that we're getting back then were a point and a half lighter than they are now. So what you're seeing, or you will see and are seeing, is that now the rates are seven. So by January, that's what you'll be seeing with the effects on the values. That's why you're seeing less sales and eventually people who need to sell will lower their prices, as you were saying, with properties in some of the community we are. Uh, and I'm saying it in West Medford and Medford where I live, and I think we're gonna be seeing it in all of you. It's just a matter of how high the feds feel they need to go. I know they said they're going to do one or two more adjustments and maybe a little lighter than the 75 to 100 basis point that they're doing. And one quarter to do that, that's a large change. And they're doing it because on purpose to slow down the economy and, and get inflation under control. Um, I think once that occurs, there's sort of a re-stabilization. I think the average over the last 30 or 40 years, interest rates have probably been around 7 or 8%, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, we we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the 90s, that's what it was. Yeah. And uh, I think over the last 10 years, people have been used to this 3 4%, yeah. so even lower. Uh, so the, the condos, which should go up a little bit less, uh, is still a very large price. The average condo um, is at $673,000, the median is at $617. And, um, you know, that is a lot of money for condominium, where the average size of it's, conquered they're a little bigger, but, you know, 16, 17, 1800 square feet. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of house. I mean, that's not a lot of house for six seventy thousand dollars it's a lot of value. And then not that you have a lot of two and three families, but of course, any that you do have um, are fairly desirable too. tend to be a little bit on the older side also, but they usually in pretty good locations. So they're up to around almost 800,000 themselves, which is a, a lot of money for, you know, the, the base of these two families are a lot of the older houses that were built a while ago but they're still warranting a high price. So if we turn the page and we look at the styles of the properties, um, you're gonna see that, again, on average, we're around 93 to 96%. Uh, but an interesting thing to look at is the median sale price of the properties. And this goes back to the affordability and why some of these property types are going up so much. If you look at the ranch, the median sale price is 834000 Well, the median sale price in the community is 1.5. Mm -hmm. It's almost half. Yeah. Uh, if you look further down and look at the um, capes, they're 1.2. Again, the average or the median is 1.5. The average is 1.7. And if you further go down and look at the splits and raised ranches, they're about 1.1. So as you look at the custom, obviously we talk about that, that's 3.1. Uh, 
and the custom colonials are over 2 million. Yet the custom colonials only went up 17%. Again, the need, the supply, the demand, and the cost. Um, and you can see that the colonial is about 1.3. Again, these are the older colonials, smaller, but they are relatively getting closer to what the average property is in the community. So if you look at this situation, you can see that um, the centuries, the customs, the um, really are the high price properties and the custom colonials and the custom properties in the century are the higher selling properties where the con con modern contemporaries and colonials are more of the average type selling properties where the ranches, capes and raised ranches are more of an affordable selling property. And if you've um, gone back to those percentages we talked about, that's where you saw where those more affordables were still going up a little bit higher than the others. Um, a, because there's more demand of it from downsizing, and B, it's an entry level way to get in. I kind of laugh that a million dollars is an entry level to get in, but in Concord, it, it is. And actually, it's not just Concord anymore, or Lexington, or, or Carlisle, um, you know, or Weston. These prices are Sudbury, Whalen, um, Howington, uh, Winchester. They're right up there, too. It's amazing how many communities median price for a house is close to a million or higher in all of these areas. It's always been a Newtons and Wellesleys and Concords and Lexingtons because, again, it's right outside of Boston and there's a lot of industry in between these communities in the Waltham, Burlington, uh, and Lexington area on 128, where a lot of people were relatively close to work and they would work there. Or even going into the city, because the 20 minute or 30 minute transfer uh, from these nice bedroom communities. And that's what the draw has been. We're seeing now that the bigger increases are even occurring in the 495 area because it's getting so pricey. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Places like um, Levenster, mm -hmm. Randolph, you go around the bend, um, Wall, Whittleton. Yeah. Well, this is a nice community, but yeah, but still expensive. Yeah. Chelmsford, yeah. yeah, very expensive. But then again, you know, uh, Chelsea's right next to Carlisle. Mm -hmm. uh, Williams yeah. right next to Carlisle. Um, you know, and, and Chelsea's not too far from Concord. Mm -hmm. Even the Berkeley. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And now another community that was always sandwiched between Concord and Lexington Bedford was much more of a, you know, lesser place to go. That's pretty expensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're up there in the average of a million dollars, mm -hmm. too. I grew up with the school, of course. Mm -hmm. Believe we were talking about it earlier. It was a lot cheaper back then than it is now. Absolutely. Um, and then just going back to the, the last part, which is worth looking at, is um, time. So the sales they take a look. Um, pretty interesting, gone up a lot from 20 sales, but during the year. You can see that, the, so the ratio for the first quarter for the single families was at 99%. Uh, and then for the second quarter was at 95. So as the percentage goes down, it means that the sale prices are going up because the assessments are at a stable point valuation. Then in the third quarter, we saw that it went down to 92. Then in the last quarter, it's not surprising for it to be stable um, because it's the fourth quarter, usually October, November, December, less sales, people are stabilized in school and so forth. But the interesting part is over the last few years, it had been stable or slightly up, but it's a little bit more up for this time period. Um, however, when we went back into 22, we saw that rise again in the spring. 
It'll be really interesting to see what this quarter brings for 22 in relationship to the first three quarters. Mm -hmm. I think you might find even less sales and maybe even a bigger shift than the 3% mm -hmm. that we're seeing in 21, which would make sense with the um, changes from the bank. Mm -hmm. um, scenario is similar for the condos, 90, although 96 and 97 for the first two quarters and then third quarter summertime and into September was 93 and then that kick up again to the 96. Sales, you know, you don't have a great amount of condos but the sales are pretty level. I think so because the 21 condos are an entry level and there's only so many of them. So as soon as they came on the market, I think that they sold pretty quickly. That's why time wasn't really, or time of year and weather really wasn't an issue. I know my sister lives in Chelmsford and she's trying to downsize as her kids are leaving. And um, she's eyeing a condo complex in a like Littleton area and so forth. So she's kind of waiting for one to come on. And then when they come on, they don't come on that often. There's still kind of those little bit of a above the asking price still paying. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is supply and demand of it. I think there's going to be a lot of supply for larger homes, uh, still maybe a little lesser supply for the smaller ones. Um, but think about over the last year in your neighborhoods, how many houses signs did you see for sale? Mm -hmm. We all walk our neighborhoods and try to get our steps in. And uh, my wife and I were walking the other day. We've noticed over the last few weeks that we walk down one street and we four or five sides. Mm -hmm. And there's maybe 50 houses on mm -hmm. So you're seeing a lot more. Mm -hmm. yeah. exactly. So I do believe there probably still will be some form of an increase. It might be tempered a little bit by the last three months. And then I think uh, probably for 23 sales, it should be more on level. This happened the uh, last time we had this was uh, 08, 09, 10. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, these communities like Concord and Lexington and around here that I value, they went level and even dropped maybe a couple of percentage points, but seemed to hold fairly strong during that time period. And, and so that's really where we stand with um, what we did this year, and what the market's looking like, and what we um, kind of see for the interim for next year. So, sorry, I'm just it up. <laughs> I did leave a document. And uh, is there any other questions from the assessor or the board of assessors? Yeah. Yeah. David had a good one uh, thinking of how you value uh, apartment buildings. Yeah. A nice question to ask. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So, apartment buildings, because <clears throat> they're a high utility, the land is valued per unit, not necessarily like a, a buildable lot. So, if, for the residentials, we build the land per smaller, larger. Still a site, but there's a little bit more value as you get more, but it's still just a little bit lot. And it's a curve. And as I said earlier, I'm not sure if you were here yet, the land to building ratio in our in the community here is about 44, 45% land, 55% building. However, with an apartment, say you still don't have, as it's not a great amount of land in the urban areas where the apartments are, a lot of times they move up. So you can have 20 or 30 units, but still only maybe 20,000, 30,000 square feet of land. So how they're looked at in the market still is that land to building ratio. So it's looked at over eight units going nine and higher, the market values them per unit based on what can be generated for the income of the rentals. So what happens is, if the property may sell for 200,000 um, a unit, the land contribution is about usually 50, 40, 50, 60,000. 
and that's how they are done. So that although it's a 30,000 square foot lot, and it may be $400,000 for a building lot or house, that same lot with that higher utility could be worth you know, 1.5 million just for the land. Um, because of the contributory total value of that income producing property that being so um, so high utility. Because if you think about it, you have 25 residences instead of one. And that's how those are looked at. That was a really good question earlier. Thank you. What about commercial? What do you see with? Yeah, so. As we were talking a little bit before we did the presentation, that it's a strong year for the commercials, um, considering the last couple of years, going up nine percent in one year. Where during COVID, you know, the streets were barren and restaurants were open. Now, as you see, um, I'm in this area really often, and um, you know, the streets are busy in the weekends and at night, and the restaurants are doing well. Um, the retail is doing well, but even the industrial is doing well because people are still purchasing things from home. And uh, as I said, the Amazons and these different places are looking for warehouse space. They're paying a lot. Industrial is stronger than commercial right now because of that. And we're seeing retail being converted into industrial. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was a property in Randolph that I'm working in that community, a bonds retail store, closed. High ceilings. Uh, it was valued at and had been purchased by someone a few years ago for about 10 million. Well, Amazon came in and um, bought it for 40 million. Uh, because they created a higher use. Well, really, what happened was Amazon came in and rented, and the people that bought it were able to rent it out to them. For like twenty dollars, triple net, meaning wow. expenses are mostly paid by Amazon. <laughs> so if you capitalize that by six percent or something, you know that's where you get the forty million. And so those are the things you're seeing. We're seeing. I just finished building Chelsea. It's a big industrial area. They have the air freight there, they have all the warehouse there, they near Boston. The values for those buildings, the industrial building, are as up to as high as $150 to $160 a square foot. They're higher than the office space. And this is the pattern right now. I was just working on Wilmington today, a very industrialized area. Oh, well, that's for that too. But great location, right up 93, 128. A lot of industry there, good clean industry. Uh, they throw out some land available, and there was uh, a sand pit area right off of 62 and, and uh, 93, $35 million for the land. It was purchased with the buildings uh, in 16 for three million. Well, they're going to fill it in. And they're going to put a 250,000 square foot warehouse distribution center there, wow. right on 62, wow. right off the highway. Wow. And they're going to get $20 from that. So, again, you know, the, the math works. And, um, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, so, even here, industrial rents are moving more in the and the years ago, they were four or five dollars. Now they're 10, 12, 14. Still triple net. So they're rising more into the 70, 80, 90 dollar, even the peripheral areas here, past 128. Um, so the industrial is strong. And because for so long, there was no industrial being built. Now, um, I think that there's a need for it, and just industry wise. People now are trying in America to build more in America and do things. And I think that we were over retail. And now with the changes in how people purchase things, uh, we're definitely over retail. Um, unless it's the type of retail that people like and want. 
The cycle of retail has been a very interesting thing. I've done a lot of classes on it and seen it. And it's a funny thing. I did this presentation about two years ago. Now you have the lifestyle centers, right? And I'm on University mm -hmm. Station over in Westport, mm -hmm. even Legacy Place mm -hmm. and, uh, and on the other end. And then you have, um, you know, some of them, the seven row is incredible. And you have even Burlington Mall, if you know what's down at Sears is gone. It's taken to put shops in the front. It's very appealing. Mm -hmm. And um, and the woman mall we were talking about earlier, when they got in the middle, mm -hmm. put apartments behind it, and then put those spaces that were in the middle when they closed that people had to walk into out front, accessible with paths and building. So there's a lot of transition to that. So assembly, uh, I do the values for the University Station. We do in the that's and that's an amazing big industrial park at one point. Turn it into um, apartments, condos, and then village purchasing retail, and then retail all inside, an office surrounding it, a hotel, an assisted living, train, right, and track right there. And believe it or not, there's a cemetery about a mile away. So you can literally go there in your twenties <laughs> in the apartment, go to the condo, the assisted living, and rest in peace. Yeah. Um, it's a kind of a fun, you know, fun way of standing. <laughs> but um, that is you know, called retail style. The retail started a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It started as funny as it is. I had shown a picture of Assembly Row with all those variables that you have. I don't think the cemetery is too close, but you have all those variables. And then I showed a picture of Pilgrim Plantation. Pilgrim Plantation. And it's not that much different, just a little more modernized. Because if you think of where we started, that's where we started, we were pretty close to transportation, weren't we? Mm -hmm. Right in the water where the ships were. Mm -hmm. And it was an enclosed area where people slept, lived, ate, and moved. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of funny. In the presentation, I had a picture of Assembly Row for my last slide and the Pilgrim Plantation, the Plantation, right next to it. And it's kind of, in a way, we've almost come full circle. From the neighborhood plazas, the malls, and then back to that community living. People want, even with the offices, Burlington's doing a great job with their office space because they have brought over the last 10 years so much retail into that area. Mm -hmm. Little, they have like over on uh, C Street in that area over there, all those little stores. It's kind of like um, mm -hmm. being in, in the Boston area, or, you know, mm -hmm. going into. Yeah. You know, some of all in uh, you know Porter Square or some of those areas, and that's what they built there because there's so much business. Now Lexington's having a problem with that because they don't have that Hotwell Ave and all those areas. You know, it used to be when everyone was there, cafeterias and so forth. Now they're all looking for uh, that entertainment aspect of it around it. And Assembly Row, they have Kings, and they have all the different activities and so forth there. And that's kind of what draws the people in. Because you have to have a stick. You have to have something that brings them in. And that's what retailers are being very creative some um, in, the, in the different areas where they're doing assigned properties that have to be very creative. Mm -hmm. These REITs and so forth, how they do these things. Mm -hmm. So the issue now is the office. If it's a certain type of office space, it's moving. Lab office right now is as hot as warehouse space because there's a big demand for biotechnology, medical, but also um, robotics and so forth. And a lot of these offices, but like in Lexington, Lexington is a very smart community, as it's here. They are preparing these office buildings that are not over $140 a square foot 
the lab offices are worth five to nine hundred dollars a square foot, but they need a lot of what? Well, they need a lot of space, but they need a lot of electricity. They need a lot of utilities. They need a lot of water to do the work that they're doing. So what Lexington is doing is working with the business owners on how to allow in these different areas, Spring Street and so forth, to turn these office buildings with a high site use by contributing to a better access for utilities to make the site prepped for the high tech companies and the biotech companies to leave the $110 rents in Cambridge and in Belmont and in those areas in Boston and come out here. Now you're starting to see this happen with Woolbert and other communities in Waltham. We are seeing lab office because there's a big demand for it. And the rents, the rents for lab office in Lexington are $55 to $60 per month. And the cap rates are five. But if you just do the math on that, take a little vacancy and a little expenses out, might be at $50 or 52 and divide that by five, you know, it's almost, uh, you know, $1,000 a square foot. And we're seeing it, and we're seeing more of it everywhere. So right now, I think the rebuilt retail with the stick of the entertainment with it and the draw of going in uh, is big. I think that the warehouse space is big. I think the lab office is very big. Um, and I think that restaurants, if they're in the right location, draw and have a little bit of newness to them, are still okay. Because I still think after the last couple of years, people are dying off of these great mm -hmm. restaurants and so yes. forth. And um, if you can get a niche of some good ones in nice high end communities like Concord, Lexington, different areas, um, bring a little bit of the North End to the suburbs or whatever, a little you know, Chinatown to the suburbs, um, you'll do well because the North End is vibrant again and people are going in there and doing it. Seaport is unbelievable. And the seaport is a stick too, lots of sticks. It's, you know, the convention center really reopened that up. But if you think about it, 15 years ago with all the old brick stone uh, buildings and everything, you get in there now, it, it's a city within itself. It's more vibrant than any other part of Boston. You know, except for maybe the North End, but North End isn't that hot. Right? Um, really, it is. Uh, more vibrant than downtown Boston, and I think even more vibrant than uh, Belmont. Mm -hmm. so, I agree. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah, because I know we live in Medford and we're close. And a lot of times when we want to go somewhere with family, or relatives, or friends, um, we tend to go get a lot and explore a different mm -hmm. part of it. Mm -hmm. And they have great restaurants. Mm -hmm. So. That again is kind of like its own little village. It's just kind of big. Um, and it's created something that took a long time. If you think back then, there was the World Trade Center and Ainsley's over there, and that was about it. Yeah. And now it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So I think what happens is, you know, kind of as old as new, as long as it's kind of flashy and inviting people because it's so convenient. You want to go like maybe to the Burlington Mall or somewhere now because, oh, it's cool. I went over there the other day with my son. Uh, he's a teenager. He had gotten a gift for his birthday, um, GameStop. We had to go get this NBA game. <laughs> so there was only a couple places that had it. So we went to the mall and he had to go there in a couple of years. Not a big mall down there. I don't know for sports. He was impressed. Yeah. And of course, a 16 year old mm -hmm. boy was pretty unusual. And he was, first of all, they had the game one in their game shop, so that was great. But he was just impressed with what they'd done and changed it from what he was used to. So I think that those are the things that are driving some of the uh, commercial. And then there's other things in the commercial that is still kind of taking a beating. 
some of the downtown areas that might not be as desirable with um, because a high end type of community is still struggling, especially their upper levels and so forth, like the second office and things like that. But um, it'll be very interesting to see what happens over the next uh, fall to 18 months with different things and how things are handled. Right now, the markets are down, but they always forecast out six to nine months. So they've already counted for a lot of that, um, meaning the stock market and that kind of stuff. So it'll be interesting to see. That's always kind of like a, a tunnel or a path or a view of the future of what will happen. So what happens over the next few months in the markets may tell a lot about what's going to happen with the economy and real estate uh, in the future. I have a couple of questions, Kevin. <laughs> well, number one is um, there is a lot of need uh, for workforce housing or affordable housing in a lot of the towns. So do you think the split levels, because they have that, so a lot of towns thinking of changing the code, you know, for accessory units within, will that be beneficial? And some people are looking for split levels because of that down the line, you know, because of the real renters on the third one. Yeah. Secondly, uh, we know now on a state level, they try to pass um, legislation that you could, you don't need any parking spaces or how you know for condominiums to be built. We've seen some of that already, and there are some projects in Everett already. They're trying to get some of the newer buildings they're putting on Broadway over there and some of the streets around there. They don't have any requirements because they say they're very close to the you know transportation. So that's another question of how will affect all that. Yeah. What are you those two? Or I forget them. Okay. Um, the affordable housing is greatly needed and just looking at, I don't think people's salaries are going up 20% this year. And I think that uh, something has to be done with that, with the affordable housing, that that percentage requirement of, I think it's 10% or 15 for units affordable, I think it has to go up. Because um, I just think that other than that, we talked about it earlier, it's just going to be gentrify the different um, towns. Going to change the demographics of things where people have lived in their towns their whole life can't afford to do it. And I just think that it's also taking away from the middle class. If there is a middle class anymore, um, it's really just separating instead of three into the two, the have and the have not. Um, I think that um, it's a grave mistake for people to allow that statutory change with the housing without parking. Um, and I think that another thing that's a problem is just transportation and roads in general related to the um, towns and cities allowing so much buildup of apartments. Uh, because the roads we have, the highways even we have, 128 and 93, were built in the 50s and early 60s when the amount of vehicles that were driving and so forth and the amount of housing that was in these areas was 30, 40 percent of what there is now. And yet, as they build all these complexes everywhere, everywhere, um, Somerville to Reading to all around, they don't change the infrastructure. Right. Yeah, that's right. And right now, we're repairing just to survive the world. Um, the roads are so terrible. Now you're seeing a lot of work being done on the roads, detours everywhere because it's such a necessity. But it's amazing that you drive down like a Route 28 or Route 16, these different routes, you're kind of bouncing the whole country. Mm -hmm. It's like you're in the country driving the back roads. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's so funny when you get on a road that's paved, you are like, oh my God, that's <laughs> um, So those two things, are extremely big issues that I think um, I don't agree with that. I think what they're doing is they are trying to push people maybe more toward um, the transportation, but transportation is really becoming for itself. Mm -hmm. And the transportation around here is old and it's 
you know, you saw what happened with the orange line. Mm -hmm. And now the green line's dealing with it, red line's dealing with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, I think a lot of it just is also they're allowing it and bending to the developers. And developers have a lot of control with politics and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they're getting looser regulations and maximizing the utility of every site that becomes available. You see it where you know buildings are being torn down, or like a lay building, and next thing you know, um, like in Medford, the stock market closed. We put like 200 units there. There's nothing, there's no link. They have a parking underneath it. And you go in and it's all building, and there's like about maybe a thousand square feet left of the land. It's right next to the other buildings that were built. How can that side of the road, where there used to be a drive in theater, the Meadow Glen Mall is now, you go over there, you can barely see to the road. Now that's just so congested in three day buildings. They just added 200 more people with 200 more cars. Or maybe 150 cars and 50 UK transportation. But they had to take the buses to get to the other transportation. So I, I think that um, now every community should really look at that closely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, because again, open space and that type of thing is diminishing in these areas. I live in West Medford, which is very lucky for Delsford is there, yeah. and there's a tremendous amount of open space. So when we go in the woods, it's like New Hampshire. But again, there's only so much of that, and I don't think that would be taken. But if you look around, one thing I noticed over the last 10 or 15 years, every time I look at the LA4, which is the total of all the parcels in the community, the land keeps dropping, the number keeps dropping and dropping. So there's just, I mean, how much really viable land is there left in this community mm -hmm. that's not under preservation or exempt and bought out by the community? And that's why the price of land keeps going up and up and up. I mean, because that's, I mean, you need land, you cannot grow land, so it's a plan you need to pay right. the economics. Absolutely. So then what yeah. happens? You, you have the tenant, right? Yeah. And you mm -hmm. have what they call the mansion at the J. Mm -hmm. So I do like as I do here. And you drive down the street here, you drive down the street in Lexington, Bedford Street, something in Lexington. It was always Cape's ranches in the 60s and 70s. Cape Ranch Loyal Castle. Cape Ranch Loyal Castle. They're 15, 20,000 square feet. They have 4,500 square feet. Yeah. It's like, this, you know, the land's so small. Mm -hmm. But that's what they do because. If a builder is going to build something, even though there's a demand for 2,000 square feet houses, as you can see, but the downsizing, it's not financially feasible for them. They pay three or 400,000, and they have to build a house worth 2 million. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what happened was the previous market that so much that the millennials, as well as the baby boomers, wanted to be close to the cities. That was a fact. Uh, COVID changed that, as you mentioned. Uh, Temporary. Temporary, yes. I think the need, though, both for the millennials and the baby boomers is to be close to where they can have a lot of stuff. They can have the restaurants, they can have the okay. space, the triangle, and all that. I Now I think it's, it's, a, it's important, and also we've seen that people, especially a lot of the millennials, they don't care about the 4,500 square foot house or the 4,000 square foot house. Mm -hmm. They want 2,000 to 2,500, an efficient house uh, with a very little footprint for the environment and all that. And they want it new. And they Very want it new. Yeah. Yeah. They want it new. So what you see is the houses are 15 or 20 years old. Uh, even if they are 2,500, they're not selling like the new ones. That's the pocket where they're beautiful homes. And yet they're um, not getting the prices. They're staying on the market a lot longer. So as we talked about earlier before we got here um, about what's going on, the percentage in the community, there were the caves, there were the ranches, there were the raised ranches, uh, because it's an entry level thing. And it's also what's in demand right now, as you say. 
So new homes, if they were 2025, some were being built, but not in affluent communities. Maybe they're still being built in the Hudson's and the you know Lemisters and Lusters and Ayers and those areas. Um, but they're not being built in anything from Western Concord, this whole belt route to over, you know, route three to route two, and then over to the pipe. And they're just not. Mm -hmm. Anything you see being built is still 3,000 and higher. Mm -hmm. Another question I have, I don't know if you notice any changes, and I know the market has shown that we have a lot of foreign buyers, you know, coming in, like Asians or different, um, you know, groups. Yeah. And these guys, they have like they don't like they have certain things as far as how the house would face if it's south and they're on the north facing, not being close to the cemetery, you know, certain stuff. Some of the groups they have their own stuff. So have you seen any of that affecting particular neighborhoods or in particular towns versus ours? Or I guess I have to really analyze their preferences based on maybe their religion or their beliefs or their upbringing. Um, but I have noticed that uh, the Asian group along with the Indian group have really increased in percentages in affluent areas uh, like Winchester, um, Lexington, and oh, Bedford. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Acton. Yeah. Yep. Acton. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, well, which is great. I mean, I think diversification is fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's really good. Um, it's just that they're also, uh, a lot of the Asians have good working, high working jobs, they have working people, Indians also. And I think that you're seeing them um, migrate to those areas with the good schools. I don't, I haven't really thought about like close to a cemetery or, or facing left or right. I guess that's too micro for me. Yeah. You know, where I look more at the macro of things. So probably, but they're looking because in, in a lot of the buildings. Interesting comment. Yeah, they want to, because if you, the house faces the south, the sun hits it most of the time, so you use less money to heat it up, you know, certain times, and that house is that's much more appealing. So it doesn't have only to do, it has to do of how the house is going to be. See, the owner of the house or the yeah. big suit, depending on well, what. Well, you know, so the whole really effect. good. We're just talking about that in my neighborhood day to day. Because my house has uh, comes over, so it's uh, west, east, west. We have a couple big trees above us on this side, a big tree here. We have a lot of shade and it's cool. And then by the time it comes over this side, it's not as strong as it was when it's coming on this side, where it's blocked by the trees. My house. Air conditioning, we only need it for like four or five, six weeks. You want to see the, you know, I was freezing the other day. It was 65 degrees outside. It was colder in my house. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very efficient, mm -hmm. that house. And it's not as much because, although we have good insulation and all that, mm -hmm. I think it's because of exactly what you said. The way that it was built and with the trees and so forth that were kept, a lot of my neighbors have cut down a lot of their trees and they have a lot of exposure to the heat. And a lot of times you'll hear their air conditioning is crap, but mine's not. So it's more efficient. So I suppose maybe the like the age and so forth, being um, where where they came from too, not having the luxuries of some of the things they have in America. Know, that they were more needed to be efficient and brought those trades here. I don't know. Just more speculative. Well, I'm originally from Greece, so for for us that was that's exactly they needed the necessity. My father was a builder, and we come from a family of builders for many years. So they are how you build your house. You know, facing which way you build your house is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And depending on the location where you are. You know, if you're up on the mountains, you use the huger stones to build it because that's what nature gives you, but also that's easier to hit. So you build it in such a way so you don't, it gives you the warm or the coldness without using any additional. So you save down that. So if you, and it's efficient. 
is deficient, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's why if you go even to Santorini, which now is one of the most, you know, they have the houses built within the rocks. And those, you know, because of what? So I think the Asians, the Indians, and a lot of these that they've seen that in the, you know, over and over in their countries, and they don't have the maybe the money or the luxury, they have their condition or the heating pumps. Or they, they, they figure they can save money. Or maybe with their smart, yeah. Yeah, so that's very smart. Yeah, so I don't know. No, I think that's a really good point. Very, very I think the likely doesn't think they're in that's just a lucky thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's you know what's so funny you say that because you know now hey guys, why you just interrupt for a second? I'm afraid I have to take off. I see you have quorum, so I think you should be all right. Yeah. All right, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank okay. you, Brandon. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Um, well, anyway, just to add one point before we go off of Greece, one of my favorite places in the world is St. Oh, that's my wife's stone. So that's <laughs> we had that discussion last time. Yeah, I, I love, love St. I've been to Greece, I love Greece, and I love Europe. But um, going to Santorini is like going back in the world. Well, I say to myself, but friends asked me how Santorini is. I said, listen, you know how you only have one Grand Canyon in the whole world? Yeah. And you cannot duplicate. No matter what you do, you cannot duplicate. But Greece has thousands of islands, and there are thousands of islands all over the world. But there is only one like that that you cannot duplicate. So either you love it or you don't love it. I mean, <laughs> you don't have in between in the world. One fair place ever been. I, it's amazing that for one day it gave a, little, a white sand beach, or a red beach, and a black beach. Yeah. The same unbelievable. In the ruins from 5,000 years ago. Oh my goodness, it was just. I just love the nightlife. Yeah. The, the old um, windmill, it's now a nice little tavern that you can hang out and watch the sunset. Well, but pretty impressive. I think here, what the need is going to come in the few years, and you raised, I think you had the very good points, uh, that the younger generation, as well as the baby boomers again, they want to be close. So we need in the towns to see that, you know, living togetherness. And the restaurants, they will do, be able to walk, to see some, to have an activity, to do something. And I, I think for the future of the towns, it's, you know, I'm not talking about the cities, but it should be a smart growth and also as you mentioned, it will have to be like um, um, high size, you know, how you can make the best out of use of size, how you do, yes. And that's, and we have a something, we have a land over here in Concord, in West Concord up there, the old mm -hmm. Starment. Yeah. That could be something like this for the future to take everything under consideration. But I don't know, I would, I, you mentioned that in the towns that already do that, the town is doing all the work for the utilities to go to the site, or the owners or the developers will have to do that. I do believe in my sense that it's a it's a it's a joint effort. It's a joint because effort. you got to get it to the site, but the site becoming making themselves compatible for it. So they promote it. They promote site ready lab office facilities. And then what's happening is the building, sometimes they keep half the building, they'll take the roof off and expand it up. They may knock it down. It, it depends on how it's suited for, um, you know, for the lab office. But the creativity in the last 20 years, I think there's 30, 30 35 lab offices. Oh, that's Wow, wow. That's something that very important for our town here because if we're going to keep the elderly, I mean, the people who've been here all their lives without you know, raising the taxes and making it affordable for them. And also, if we want to keep bringing in the young, you know, the millennials with good jobs or, you know, mm -hmm. or all that, we have to be created by doing something like that. So it will be sustainable even for the future. So we can have both, you know. I, I really think that you do have to consider all that. A uh, Burlington, that we had the Burlington model 10 years ago, 12 years ago. There were like five, six restaurants yeah. that you're in. Now there's 30, 35. And it helps so much with filling all of that industrial and office space mm -hmm. that they have over there. Yeah. You had a couple of the 50, I think they think one on that street. Too. Yes. Yeah. yeah, they do. Yeah. 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 They have the hospital. I mean, smaller. Well, ladies, they yeah. actually yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty big. Yeah. It's pretty big. Yeah. 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 That's been funny that we've, we've been seeing uh, CIP's been a shrinking portion of 
our value mm -hmm. for many years now. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's <laughs> nice, maybe it'd be nice if it were larger value again. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it, it takes a site at a time, but it, I think there has to be a lot of work with the community, redevelopment departments in the community, and with the developers to have a fine line between maximizing utility, but also dealing with the environmental issues that go in there, in the infrastructure. Sure. I mean, I, I am asked to do a lot of like, feasibility studies and different things, and uh, you have to take all that into consideration. When we do it. And I think in a lot of cases, um, there's great things that are going on with energy, with solar, and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, but there's so much more that you can do with it that aren't done with the electricity and solar and so clean. But it's becoming vital, it's becoming vital that we do it, obviously, with the you know, effects happening in the environment and so forth. I mean, we're really turning into a uh, movie. That you think you just see these things happen in the movies, and then you see things like down in Florida and the devastation. I was in San Andreas three or four or five years ago. Now it's gone. Mm -hmm. well, I'm a realtor, that's what, and we had a um, presentation about solar um, in a class actually on you know, alternative and solar funds and all that. And uh, well, there are a lot of pros because also a lot of the towns are thinking of. Banning, you know, fuse um, mm -hmm. fuel and all and gas and all that and, oh, going, yeah. and going electric. So that's another conversation that then how much and who will affect. So my you know my opinion on that is mixed anyway. But I was saying that when one that we haven't discussed about it because solar is great, but we have an issue as far as how do we depose the solar panels after the life mm -hmm. cycle of 25 years? Yeah, sure. And we know that they have heavy metals and all that. And how is that going to affect the water table? Yeah, and yeah. Anyway, that's my opinion. And batteries, no, that's a different story. Uh, I think they have to be designed environmentally safe. Well, that's now, now you know, on the national level, there is there a lot of discussions about all that because they face, they start facing this. California has a huge problem as far as or transportation, mm -hmm. disposing. And, uh, and wind. And wind, same. Wind thing. is a big deal. But but then there are things with sound and with environmental issues with the big windmills, like out in Gloucester, out, but when they want to do out in you know, Market Vineyard and so forth. Well, it, affects the, it affects the birds, it affects a lot of different stuff than wind. Mm -hmm. I think one of them, which Iceland uses, is geothermal, you know, which is the best because mm -hmm. it comes right from the air. Now there though, the towns will have to figure out on a lot of these parcels that you mentioned, all the sites that you mentioned ahead of time and do the preparation for it. So later on down the line, you could build on it, but everything, you know, the infrastructure will be there because, you know, there is a temperature, what, 25 degrees, there's a certain temperature of Celsius or whatever, Fahrenheit. So you just go up minimum, like five, and then you go down. So, and it's there, it's easy, but you have to have all that, Infrastructure, as far as or you know, think about it. Yeah. What do you want to do? With it how well, I think it? anything that's built new too has to be like you know the green building. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, so mm -hmm. there's a great the ratings and so forth. Um, you know, you see like when I inspect buildings and, and they have a level of you know what rating they have. Um, the green effect. You go up to the roof; it's all white. It's all different reflections. It's got all different things. I think all those things just have to be done all the time now. <clears throat> and everything that we build and new and so forth. And it just has to be done that way because if you do it at every level, at every angle, vehicles, housing, structures, so forth, next thing you know, um, you're creating your own energy and you're not um, adding CO2 to the, to the air. And, I mean, that's really what you have to do. You have to keep as much greenery as you can um, because that's the balance. And we're losing the balance. Well, FHA and HUD, they give on the appraisal report, they give extra values if the solar panels are owned by the homeowner. If a third party is the installer, it doesn't affect the value of the property. Yeah. I think that's kind of tricky. 
because it doesn't make any difference who has in store. I mean, if you want to go through this, they have to figure out a better solution rather than going that. So anyway, that's a lot of, I don't want to take it. <laughs> well, the balance between, um, the problem is, is you, you know, the livelihood for so many people is that land. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it comes down to that if, if green is good. I guess it is to a degree, but it's also you have to have a balance of things that are good for the environment and not your surroundings. Yeah. Any other questions? We kind of got off topic a little bit, but um, it was really good. Yeah, very interesting. Well, in your business and in my business, you know, I was a realtor too. I was a builder and um, I sold it and I raised it now and so forth. So it's good to have that understanding and balance and everything. Um, but it's an interesting field and it's always a challenge. And in my instance, because I work for a company doing mass appraisal, mm -hmm. we are asked to value everything from a camp to a nuclear plant. Wow. So uh, my knowledge is fairly extensive now from my education. Basically, I have an MAI, which is like a PhD in appraising, mm -hmm. and you know, had to through the years all the training, being that we as a mass appraiser is doing these cities and communities, I also helped design software for New York City. And so it just enlightens you and brings a lot of opportunity for learning and seeing different things. Well, I mean, for me, I, I, I'm a licensed realtor, I'm a licensed contractor, I have a CSL. Mm -hmm. I was a licensed appraiser on the state of Massachusetts. I didn't practice it, but I took it. I was a licensed loan originator in the state of Massachusetts. So, I mean, I like stuff and I like to learn because, mm -hmm. and I try to see it holistic, like the whole package. Exactly. My main because my background is engineering. I went to school here for engineer, but I do. I, I work on my own as a realtor, so yeah. it's a different story. Maybe because my father was a builder and a carpenter, maybe yeah. he liked what he did, and I love houses, I love towns, I love. Well, that's my man. My brothers were builders, so, so I, I did that. You know, and work with them. We have to see it as a package. If you don't see it as a package, and you learn after. And in my case, every day I feel like. I know nothing because you see something over there and something is blows your mind and then you say, wow, you have to go back again and try to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. learn. Oh, and the world is changing every moment. You know, I have kids that go to college and high school and thank God I do because I, I wouldn't know anything if they didn't tell me all the things that they know now. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, please change. Yeah, they're right. They're, well, the, the youth is flexible. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a wonderful thing. I think to stay youthful, you have to stay flexible. Exactly. Yeah, you have yeah. to better. Yeah. And I always yeah. just tell my team, I mean, we have a lot of people that work with me. I don't consider them employees in my team. I'm a big sports guy. And I think that the only thing that I tell all the time to my team, and it's obvious, with the challenges that we have all, all day, all of us, the only constant is change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if you keep that in mind and be humble and know what you know and learn what you don't know, I, I think that's the best way to think. Mm -hmm. Well, you, there, there are two schools of thought that they teach you at the military academies. And when you said that everything changed, that was Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher who said thousands of years ago, a father is, so everything flows, so everything changed. So uh, there are two schools of thought. It used to be the Napoleon way of you know, uh, doing business and the Alexander the Great way of doing business. After World War II, most of the CEOs, they came out of the military. That's why you have the pyramid. Yeah. And you had your general managers and Napoleon used to do his wars by sitting up on the hills and the wars were down the valleys. So he would give the orders to the chain of command who would go down and then everything will relay back to him and he will do the changes yeah. and go back again and this and that. And we know Napoleon had water you know, in other words, so he lost. On the other hand, Alexander the Great, his way of managing or doing or you know, fighting in wars was he took his team, smaller teams, but he took his team to the battle site at least one to two weeks before the battle. So they would start with the topography, they will be well rested, they will be well fed, and they will be anxious to fight. And then at the time of the battle, 
he would be in front of them with his team and you know he could change course instantly by moving his hand or by doing certain things mm -hmm. so he didn't have to relay any information back mm -hmm. and that's why he was much more efficient i think since september 11 things changed and we went from the cost you know from a war that was very stable mm -hmm. to something that is extremely unstable where people have or teams have to change on the fly yeah. but in order to do that all the team players are important Mm -hmm. So you have to invest a lot into the team players, educate the team players, manage the team players, have an open channel of command, you know, of, of communication with them, yeah. and, that, and then you, you can be much more efficient and accomplish more actually tremendous, and that's why the success of the teams like Navy SEALs and all of these guys, mm -hmm. but your, your team are all valuable, they are assets. Mm -hmm. so, I totally agree, that's I am. And That's look at the market, process. what it did with the September, you know, I mean, 2020 now, who would believe that everybody would say, oh, let's add an office, let's add some additions. Yes. Everyone's home yes. and they're improving their homes, they're ripping them down, they get right. bigger right. and right. in right. the year, you know, who, everything went skyrocketed. And you have to move past them. You have to move with it. Boards, we have to realize that, mm -hmm. you know, everybody else has to realize that, that everything is moving and everything is yeah, you know, so you have to have a system where if changes happen, you could change, make the adaptation, so whatever it's needed, so you could, uh, you know, I reflect to that. And so I, I talk too much. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, but, I, but I think it's very interesting, and I agree. And, uh, and I, I see where you're coming from, like from the 60s and 70s and 80s, like the, the bowling type of business. And then how it is now. I think I agree with you. And it, you know, I don't, I never thought of it as working like Alexander the Great did, but <laughs> um, when you put it that way, that's how I found the best success with the team that I have. So you build your own team, yeah. that you gave them the knowledge, they can uh, they can always come back to oh, you. And you appreciate them and treat them like yeah. You know? Like I said, I coach all the time, so coaching I think is a great way of learning business. Oh, yeah, it's different to look at Coach Belichick. He's <laughs> 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 He's done it. He's done it. Yeah. Well, what happens when you do well, people expect more. Yes. Yeah. Which is fine because, you know, the, the, you have to do better. So, yeah. I mean, if you, if you take everybody everything, has good days in that, if you take everything for granted, you know, then you're going to, you're going to get old, you know, you have to be young. So you have to continue. You have to challenge. You have to do that. So anyway. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, it was great talking with everyone. And um, hopefully there's a better understanding of what we did for the rebound. Yes. And it, it made a little knowledge on some of the aspects of, um, you know, on our end as the mass appraising group. A little different than the fee appraisers and how they, they do things. Um, we do have to be more diversified and understand things at a more macro level, but we do bring it right down to the mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank you. much. Sure. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I gotta go. My daughter's playing basketball. Thank <laughs> 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 you so much. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> This well, will be on our website as well, so if people missed it, they can. Yep, it will be on okay. YouTube on the website. Right. Well, thank you for having me and Mike for coming and answering all my questions. Sure. Yes. 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 I really appreciate all it. Of, uh, on the site for all the things that she's in. Yes, right. Yeah. In the YouTube, right. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I appreciate it. I know. <laughs> All right, moving on. Okay, so I think uh, at this point we can actually uh, do not call the meeting to order uh, the board presentation. Okay, so let's call uh, the meeting. And at this point, I think we can call the meeting to order. So we can call the order at 7 30. 7 30 p.m. Got it. Uh, and um, let's see. So we have, I think we have, uh, I think common values that by 2023. Do you have any further discussion on it? Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So right now we're in public disclosure as of um, October 18th, and our last day is October 31st. And we have our 
books out at the both libraries. They're at the townhouse. They're at the Council on Aging. They're in our office as well as they're on the public website. Yep. And we also have the news and notices. So if anybody has any questions or wants a property record card or wants us to go out and check out their property, we're available. If they want us to explain, you know, what we went through tonight and things, that's going to be available on the web as well Absolutely. as we're all available working mm -hmm. in the office yeah. as well as working out there. Have you been getting any um, calls? Or any we have. We've been getting good calls where people would like their property record card. They're interested in looking at it and asking a few questions. Um, a few of the uh, corporate were, are looking into budgetary and looking for the valuation and potentially what's the rate, you know, of that. But um, we're getting positive input, which um, shows good data, mm -hmm. good All data positive. collecting and good. Mm -hmm. so, so far, so good. Yeah, and everything's on the website, so we're transparent with right. everything, and they love that. So they're happy about that. Yeah, um, I went on there many of um, the assessors. You go to the assessors, and then you go to the, and the very first page. Is it, oh, it's all about the mm -hmm. revaluation, yeah, and then right in the middle of that, is it's, you know, click here, and you can get the, you know, just the various things you can get the values and absolutely everything. Put yeah. that and, 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 and this and this enormous spreadsheet. It's uh, done. <laughs> Res <Res-com> review. <yeah. laughs> absolutely. <laughs> we put that all on Monday after okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Good. Okay. So um, okay. So that's uh, that concludes our discussion on the uh, property values that we we're, we're doing this mm -hmm. and so we can proceed to a uh, release of lien. Release of lien. So this is a this is a property at 461 Old Bedford Road, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, Old Bedford Road. It's a Shimoni property. Mm -hmm. It actually has not been in Chapter 61A since 2004, but they never asked for a release of lien. So um, since it's been out for over 10 years, mm -hmm. we can just release the lien, and it's pretty. Um, yeah, it's pretty. Standard. This is a routine matter. A routine, routine matter. So I need two of you to sign, but I need one to have it notarized. So if someone could come in at some point and go to the townhouse and have it notarized, that would be great. Okay. Well, I can do that tomorrow. Oh, awesome. Great. So why don't you come to our office? Well, I'll do that, I can do it tomorrow. Yeah, perfect. Why don't you come to our office? I'll go over with you and we'll have it notarized over the town. Okay. Oh, that'd be perfect. All right, so I'm just going to give it to the other two of you to sign. Because they have to take it to the registry of deeds, right? Uh, you just have to take it to, yes, they have to go to the registry of deeds, correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. David, you want to sign that too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, they don't stop. Um, oh, make a motion. Oh, yeah. David, you want to make a motion just to accept the reasonable one? Yeah. Uh, yes, actually, I would. Um, well, so we make a motion to release me. Um, that would be over. Um, I would like to good. I would like to make a motion to release the uh, lien for uh, the property. Four sixty one Old Bedford. Four sixty one Old Bedford Street, Coming Road. Okay. Okay. Well, motion a second. All in favor? I think we can do this by voice vote since we do not have anybody on. So. Yes. Right. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, Passes unanimously. Perfect. I think it's being sold, Ari. That's what I heard. So. I did notice that they're doing some cleaning. Yeah, yeah. I right. think that's why they're asking for the release of lien now because it's being sold. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, to clear the title. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, so uh, time assessor. Uh, so we do have um, an ATB case that was formal, 14 Walden LLC, and um, I was having an ATB case, and I gave a motion to compel because we didn't have any information why, you know, how much did they want off, how, where is the income and expense, why, and when I um, did a legal motion to compel, they came back and withdrew. So that worked out. <laughs> so that is closed. Withdraw. That's good. And then our next step is fixing and putting in all the accountant has to put in their information. The CFO has to put in their information. The clerk has to put in the votes and to get the tax recap on our website. 
After public disclosure period is over and they get certified. And our classification hearing is coming up November 28th. Okay. Anything else that you know? Or? This is the next steps, you know, that are coming. We're in the process. Okay, yeah, I think I'm done. I think I'm done the whole calendar for, for this procedure. We're well into the calendar. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we are. <laughs> next part. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think the uh, floor is open for board comments. I think the presentation was very good and very long. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for uh, as far as the appraisal and all that. Mike is very knowledgeable in Montreal. He does many towns. He's been in it for many years and he is on point. And what the good thing is, it's mass appraisal, not individual, where some people come in, you know, why is this? Why is that? It's mass and all the numbers and figures are here to that top, which is nice. It's the, the explanation tonight of the why. Mm -hmm. And he knows the town. He's been with us for 22 years. So. You know, sit down inside and out. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. I think if, um, if any um, resident wanted to dive deeper into how the appraisal was done, will you be able to sort of meet them and yes, like absolutely. all of the information yeah. that's listed? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Without obviously calling Mike. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, we know the property. We know the property. Okay. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of the only worry I would have that uh, someone may have questions and all of a sudden they can get the answers, and I think that's something, you know. Yeah, um, very important. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, we need to go into executive session just for like five minutes. I, I, I suppose before we do that, I should, I should just um, uh, bring up I did, that we did have a, uh, a presentation to the select board on Monday on the um, residential. Uh, tax exemption. Um, and we've been looking into this, and, and, and actually, there's some some piece of information that I'm still finding um, hard to get in. Some 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 apparently some towns are have, very happy to talk to you about their experience with it, and some towns just don't want to. Revoke it. Yeah, and there was no answer why. Maybe deeper speaking to uh, a yeah. board member. Uh, in Marlboro, yeah. and he didn't know why they revoked it, but they revoked it because it, it was it happened after you know before he got on yeah. there. So I thought that was interesting to have to find out why it was revoked. You know, if you know, I knew that the power plant was sunset, but we didn't know. Yeah. So I mean, I think I think there's some 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 maybe some more digging we could do. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Board members and I can perhaps help with that a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's some, I mean, it's really, it's really uh, you know, if, if this being a refounding year and all, um, I really hate to take a lot of the staff time to, to, to do these right. presentations. Mm -hmm. There's so much to do, but we just need regular duties at the office. Come on. <laughs> Yeah. What do you mean thinking of going that route to sort of eliminate it? Or what's the, what is the discussion? Well, I think this black board would like more information on it. And um, I don't know. We serve as a special select board and a lot of information. And I think we should get it to them. I just, right. it's just it's, 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 picking up is just not an easy thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, did, uh, I did attend the, oh, I also did attend the board. Uh, I attend, sorry, the, um, Chair's breakfast this morning, and um, so I don't know that. And I did mention one of the things I that we don't know is like, I actually don't know what the effect of renters is. We assume it gets passed through, but um, does any <laughs> does anybody have better information on it than I do? I, I don't know. Um, what, what was the question? Oh, when, when, when it, when it, you know, if, so if, you know, if, if apartments will go up. And, let's face you know, it: when when an expense goes up, it's, a landlord it's, it doesn't eat it; it goes to the rent. It's going to have yeah, I don't, so yeah, that's it's, the real yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. what anybody said: it, the real yeah. deal is you're in it to make money. And, you're in, you're yeah. a landlord; you're not in it to for the for the goodness of the community. You're in it to yeah. make money. So when you when 
you get an extra bill, it goes trickles into who's yeah. going to pay it. And, I, and, and my hunch is that he does landlords and mm -hmm. not competing with landlords and acting and competing with other landlords and companies. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so Absolutely. It's, it's not going to. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, I, at least. Well, it's been a long time since I've worked with the apartment mm -hmm. in Congress, but, uh, but I recall that, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a different market. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So. And right now, being in preliminary certification, we're reaching out and finding out the answers. Once we're certified, we'll give them the answers. Anyway, um, keep delving into it. Keep delving into yeah, it. Definitely yeah. exact. Well, I, I thought I thought I thought the other thing to come up and talk about this, that there's that there's talk of this. Mm. Because I don't know, it, it could have wide ranging consequences. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Do you think there's something we can do as a committee, as the board members, you know, go out to help with all this? Or? Well, that's I, that's that that's, I mean, I, I think uh, bringing in our 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 uh, actually, um, particularly um, you know, uh, having you know expertise and in, 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 uh, uh, any any expertise that we can bring in to to bear on this is uh, valuable. Um, oh, we have one right here. Right here, dealing with Tony Ranches who wrote this yeah. information, and and you know it's really for communities that. Are in a city that have a lot of non owner occupied in it, except for second community resort communities. And that's really where the map is shown where it offsets the cost for the residential exemption. Yeah. You know, for example, Somerville, where a lot of them have, you know, commercial that offsets and picks it up and, and things of that nature. So, you know, we have to do some more research, but as of now, you know, yeah, it's right. really not for us to recommend, but us to do the research and present yeah. what we have and then to vote for, um, you know, what they feel is right. Yeah, and I think, I, yeah, I, I don't know, I think, I think we can, I think we can do some, uh, I, I, I will try doing some playing around. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I love playing around with, with just taking it back to spreadsheets and just something else and saying, okay, well, like, like with this formula and my uh, this percentage, yeah, what's the effect? I mean, we remember, I remember doing this with the rest of the uh, senior means test. Yeah. Oh and, my gosh. Yeah. And, and, uh, and just, just, just up, you know, look at it every different direction. Absolutely. And comes out of it. Maybe a five percent, four percent to a thirty-five percent, and going yeah. all over the range. Or, or just, how much does it offset? Yeah, you know, they're pretty, they're really interesting questions. Well, like, okay, if, if we wanted to, well, if, if, if the question came up uh, uh, Monday was, well, could we? Can we, can we tune this so that it, so that for the median house in town, it just offsets the uh, the, the, the increase from the um, from the bond issues for the uh, for the middle school, mm -hmm. which of course now is a variable. Yeah, <laughs> so just yeah, yeah. Up. We don't know we don't know how much of that is going to be, but I think you know we can make it some. It's going to be somewhere in some range of numbers, so we can we can make a guess on that. Mm -hmm. Well, the number they're discussing is about a thousand dollars. That's what it's going to affect. If we stay within the hundred million, now they're asking for one yeah. away, you know, eight, eight million more. So yeah. I mean, uh, but, but it's 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 going to be yeah. Yeah. But, but it's going to be yeah. But, that, but they're only yeah. They're only they're not talking about double. They're talking about percentage. So, yes. so it's yes. going to be it's going to be somewhere. Yeah, you know, that 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 original number is approximately yes. what it's going to be. It's, right. Right. It's, you know, just they're just there's yeah, like about ten percent. It is a residential exemption. Yeah. The answer for that with some people that well, don't qualify for exemption to getting the exemption. Right. Yeah. And, yes. and it is that for that. Yeah. Well, you know, well, you tune it just right so it comes up exactly even yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just right so it comes up exactly our mm -hmm. proper. And then some people are and, and all the people below the median actually come out a little better. Mm -hmm. People above the median, not so good. Yeah, <laughs> double, double yeah. whammy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 the all and then part of the upper end of the and, market again. And the people in the track they hang and the plus the plus the box. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, so a lot of time it might be difficult because we have the same rate for commercial you know properties as well as residential yeah. properties. Right, there's no split rate. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we do not yeah, we can and 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 split rate is just a non-starter for us. We don't we don't have we don't commercial. Do it. Right. We don't have to do it. Right. Yeah, it would not fill them when 
don't have any virtual yeah. yeah. So the towns that you see that uh, Boston, Somerville, certain towns, if you look on the commercial rate, is over three percent, you know, three percent. Yeah. Versus the residential, which is one point four, one point five, one point eight. Right. So Correct. They have the income coming from that, and they can offset it here for us. I think it's. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to be very, very creative. You have to go very fine tuning to the bottom so you because you want to be fair to everybody. So it has a lot of answers. A know, lot of A lot of questions and a lot of yeah. answers to figure out the proper formula or to decide. And there is a formula. If there is a formula. There is, there is very clear formula with that. Discussion for future meetings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. All of them. <laughs> Um, one, 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 one thing that I that, that occurred to me, I think another, another thing I've known is, I, I mean, you can look at the, at the um, you can just look for TR in the, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the spreadsheet and find out there's a zillion trusts in town. But, oh, but how to figure out which of them, you know, some of them probably qualify for the, for the I mean, if, 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 if trust is done made up in a certain way, it will qualify and you get the exemption and they're just made up differently than you don't fall you don't get inside. I mean this is this is well is that you are the beneficiary oh. and the trustee yeah. so you have to take it to that next level where they like that Kirby versus the yes, Medford yeah. and, and it shows that you know they didn't qualify yeah. because they weren't the trustee. But but, but he had everything right except for that one thing right mm -hmm. he was not he was not himself the trustee. Correct. That's right correct. But everything else is okay. But it's just that one thing. Oh, yeah, in that one thing, it show. Yeah. So we have to ask for copies of all the trusts. Right, and you have and to now do there's more and more trust. every, and then to find out, do you vote for, you know, are you voting in the town? Is this your domicile? Do you have an excise tax here to make sure that we vet to, you know, that we're not giving it away and we're doing the right chain of command. Anyways, um, okay. So, um, executive session. Yeah, but I think uh, yeah, I think we're we're, we're yeah. Uh, I so think we can still just, record. No, no, it sorry. is until we enter. Until we okay. vote and we'll enter. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. So we're going to um, let's see. We have a form for this, right? Yeah. There's a specific verbiage. Oh, it's in the it's in the. You should all have a folder. Do you have it? You should all have a copy of the Oh yeah. Oh wait. This is. <laughs> Yes, we got it. So, uh, anyone care to? Yeah, yeah. I would like to make a move to enter into executive session to consider statutory exemption applications, community preservation surcharge exception applications, and appellate tax board cases in compliance with the open meeting laws, purpose number seven to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special or federal granting aid requirements and to adjourn the meeting from the executive session. Thank you. Um, that's the exact one. Mm -hmm. uh, seven. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this has to be roll call vote. So um, we'll go from uh, my right to left, uh, Ari. All right. Okay. Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. 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 Aye.